Okay, good morning. Um, I want to thank Jennifer and Katrine for um, the invitation to come speak, and it's really a pleasure to be here today at UC Irvine um, and with so many wonderful colleagues in the field. So I am fortunate to get to start the day and uh, hopefully at a point where you guys are not too hungry yet so the pictures of cheese won't be too painful. Um, <laughs> so I'm, my, I started my lab two years ago. Um, well, I started my lab seven years ago. Um, uh, I got a fellowship that basically paid me to study cheese, which was the most amazing thing ever, and um, moved my lab two years ago to UC San Diego, where I started as an assistant professor in the molecular biology section. And the work that, the, the question that really inspires my research is trying to understand how we can begin to dissect these highly complex microbial ecosystems that you find in pretty much any environment that you look at. And so we, we know a lot about you know, individual organisms and how they grow in the lab in isolation, you know, something like E. coli and LB, but <laughs> we also know, um, we're very well aware now, that microbes pretty much never exist in isolation. In fact, they exist in these highly complex communities surrounded by many different species. The problem, though, is that um, these communities, as we'll probably hear throughout the day today, um, have incredibly high diversity. So you can have hundreds, if not thousands, of species living together. So you know, imagine going from um, a lab where you're studying a single organism at a time, which is what I did um, for most of my academic career, to then saying, OK, well, instead of one organism, I'm going to study 1,000 organisms. So that's you know, no easy task. Um, so this makes it incredibly challenging to try and understand how these communities actually work. Another major challenge that we face, so not just the fact that these, or, these communities are highly complex, but we have still a really hard time getting many of these organisms into culture. So they exist as part of these complex systems and complex environments, and we have a hard time recreating those environments in the lab so that we can actually isolate organisms and study them um, to measure how they grow and behave under different conditions. So that's a, a big hurdle. So basically, microbial communities are not really good model systems. So they're difficult to manipulate both in situ in their natural environment um, because of this complexity, and they're also difficult to manipulate in vitro. So it's hard to deconstruct them into their individual parts and understand how those parts fit together to form communities. So the way that biologists have for um, many generations addressed this challenge of, of trying to um, answer fundamental biological questions in complex systems is by using model organisms and model systems. So instead of, <laughs> instead of this high complexity and difficulty in manipulation, we want something that's simple, easy to reproduce, and easy to manipulate, right? So we want to be able to do many, many experiments and, and really dissect something. And so in molecular biology, this really started with work on phage lam lambda, so a very, very simple um, model system um, that kind of got us to in early stages of understanding DNA as the molecule of inheritance and, and many other wonderful aspects of molecular biology. E. coli, um, which is my personal favorite. I did my PhD on E. coli. And then you have many other types of model systems like Saccharomyces, cerevisiae, C. elegans. So the, the question is, can we think of a simple microbiome that we might be able to use as a simplified model system? So sort of in the same vein of using systems of reduced complexity that can grow quickly, we can reproduce in the lab easily, and do experiments with, can we do this with a microbiome? <clears throat> and as you may know um, <laughs> from the title of my talk, um, we're, in my lab, we're actually using um, fermented food microbiomes um, because they have all of these wonderful properties that you might look for in a model system. So whether um, you're a fan of kimchi, fermented cabbage, um, sourdough bread, kombucha, beer, wine, cheese, these are all foods where over thousands of years, humans have figured out how to precisely manipulate microbial communities to our own advantage. 
you know, for these delicious food products. But in the process, basically, they have set up systems in which relatively simple communities form under highly controlled conditions, which we could easily replicate in the lab. <clears throat> So the starting point for me in this, in this area to try and develop a system based on fermented food was looking at cheese. And the reason that I found cheese so fascinating is because we have these wonderful communities that grow on the surface of cheese as it's being aged in a cheese cave. Okay, so um, <laughs> I'll give you just my brief Cheese 101 uh, lesson here. So, so cheese starts with milk. You take that milk and you ferment it with lactic acid bacteria. That causes the curds to separate from the whey. You take those curds, that's your fresh cheese. It's tart and milky, the acid from the lactic acid bacteria is there. And then you take a fresh wheel of cheese and you put it in a dark, damp, moldy cave. Okay. So somebody decided to do that probably 10,000 years ago or something like that. Um, and it turns out it was the best idea anybody's ever had. Um, <laughs> because during that, that uh, once you put this cheese into this, uh, this cool, humid um, environment, what happens is that the surface of the cheese gets colonized by this amazing community of bacteria and fungi. And different types of cheeses have different communities. But this is a cross-section close-up of what this community looks like. It's a biofilm-like structure that forms on the surface of cheese. <clears throat> you can look inside this structure. This is a scanning EM that I took um, of the inside of a cheddar rind. So we call, we call this structure the rind. Um, we don't call it that. Cheesemakers call it that. So, <laughs> um, And you can see this incredibly densely packed microbial community. So many different bacteria and fungi all living together. And we estimate that there's about 10 billion viable cells in every gram of cheese rind based on plate counting methods. So it's a, still a very alive community. And as I said, different types of cheeses have different microbial communities, so different assemblages of bacteria and fungi that are growing together in these different um, cheeses. And so what I wanted to do was, you know, sort of having this idea initially, well, this could make a good system, but how do you actually go from some, some potential for a model system to actually building something that I could potentially um, use as the foundation for the rest of my research career? So what we wanted to do was map out patterns of microbial diversity across cheeses from around the world so we can get a baseline understanding of what these communities actually look like, who's there, how they behave. We wanted to show that we can actually um, move past the stage of just documenting diversity to actually being able to dissect and completely deconstruct these communities into their individual members, which is, again, a major challenge in the study of microbial communities. And then we wanted to show that we could t start from this uh, collection of pure cultures and rebuild communities in a highly producible and controlled environment in the lab. Okay, so we could go from a natural system, study it in, in situ, and reconstruct the system in vitro. And so to do this, um, my, my first postdoc and I spent a lot of time in cheese caves. Um, <laughs> this is looking down into a cheese cave in Vermont. You can see different um, hundreds, if not thousands, of wheels of cheese aging in this cave. And so we basically went in to this environment and started sampling cheeses much in the same way that you would go to any environment and sample for microbiome. So we'd collect the sample, we'd bring it back to lab, we extract DNA, and we'd sequence um, the different parts of the community. So we did this across 10 different countries, and we collected samples from 362 wheels of cheese, which is pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> you can see many of the samples came from Europe. This is Vermont, highly sampled here. Um, a couple from California and the Pacific Northwest. And we went in, like I said, we extracted DNA, we sequenced the bacterial 16S region of this DNA, and we also sequenced the fungal ITS region, which fungi are often ignored in studies of microbial diversity, um, which is sort of a shame. Um, so we ended up being able to draw out this, this distribution of uh, relative abundance of different species within each of our cheeses. So each column here is a different cheese, and so on the top is showing the relative abundance of different bacterial genera, and then we have the relative abundance of different fungal genera. And so we were able to get 
actually quite a lot out of this data set, but the point I want to just focus on quickly here is that we found 14 abundant bacterial genera, which are listed here, and 10 abundant fungal genera. So the system is relatively simple. So we had sort of a manageable number of, of types of microbes that we wanted to then try and isolate in the lab. Um, and however, despite the fact that we have relatively few numbers, there actually has quite a bit of diversity in terms of the taxonomy of these different groups. So we have um, uh, four different major phyla of bacteria and several of fungi. So the other thing we wanted to ask is, okay, well, this is great. We can look at a piece of cheese and, and sequence it, but is this a reproducible process? Um, or is this something more random? And it turns out that if you look at the formation of these communities over time, so this is a two-week or a two-month sampling period, um, and looking at the bacterial diversity and fungal diversity over time, you see this highly reproducible pattern of succession. And I'll just say here that these species are not inoculated onto the cheese in any way. These are coming from the environment. So this is a sort of spontaneous um, colonization of this environment, but it's happening in this highly reproducible manner. Which makes sense because you can buy the same cheese from the same place you know, year after year and it tastes pretty similar, right? So these communities are forming very reproducibly. This also gives us some insight into how the community develops and what some of the types of ecological interactions um, are that might be driving community formation. So that was sort of um, our initial sort of dive into the diversity and a little bit about the ecology of the system. But we then wanted to show we could actually take the system apart. And so we targeted these 14 dominant bacterial genera based on this is their sequencing relative abundance from the communities. And it turns out we are able to culture representatives of every single one of these genera in the lab in isolation. These are some pictures of these um, different bacterial phyla um, and some of our isolates of these genera. And we've now done quite a bit of genome sequencing um, to try and start to build up not just culture collections, but genomic databases that represent these organisms. And the same is true for the fungi. We're able to culture representatives of all the fungal genera that we observe by sequencing. And these are some pictures. And we're just starting to do fungal genome sequencing, which is a little bit more complicated than bacterial. So, okay, and then the next stage, as I described, is we didn't want to just be able to isolate them, we wanted to rebuild communities in vitro. And so we set up what we call our in vitro cheese assays. We take fresh cheese, we freeze dry it, we mix it with water and salt and auger, autoclave it. It comes out of the autoclave like a cheese smoothie. And, <laughs> and then we pour it into Petri dishes or 96 well plates. And then we're able to pull from this diverse culture collection and rebuild whatever combination of organisms that we want um, and watch community formation in the lab. So this is sort of a fancy cheese plate, and this is our sciencey cheese plate. OK, so the first experiment that we wanted to do is see, could we actually reproduce this pattern of succession that we saw out in the caves. And so we took the three dominant bacterial genera from that succession and the three dominant fungal genera from that succession. So these are all isolated individually. And then we remixed them together in equal proportions all at the same time and inoculated them onto our sterile cheese media. And what we saw is it's pretty remarkable that we could actually reproduce succession in our in vitro system with just this set of six species. Um, so we have a bacterial um, succession that mimics what we saw in the caves, as well as a fungal succession that, we, that mimics what we saw in the caves. Okay, so at this point, we felt that we had basically built, uh, laid the foundation for the, the research in the system. We, we described it, we isolated all the organisms, and we showed that we can rebuild these communities in the lab. So then, what does one do <laughs> um, now that you have a community in the lab that you can actually work with? So what I'm most interested in is understanding how interactions influence communities. And so what most of the research in our lab now is focused on interactions between different species within a community and between species in the environment. And we're interested in understanding how these interactions impact community level phenotypes. So how does that influence the structure, the function, the reproducibility and resilience of a microbial community? And so I'm gonna tell you about just one um, story from our lab. 
in which we're using a, um, uh, an interesting approach to try and think about how species interact within a community. And so I'm going to tell you about the work we're doing looking at horizontal gene transfer. And um, horizontal gene transfer is this incredibly fascinating process. So uh, bacterial species are asexual, so they don't mate with each other to um, hybridize and, and generate uh, diversity in their genome. However, they are known to be incredibly promiscuous in terms of sharing genetic material between cells. So if this species here has this really amazing red gene, um, it can transfer this red gene over to this other species through a number of mechanisms, including phage-based transduction, free DNA-based competence, or um, uh, pore-based uh, cell, direct cell-to-cell -cell contact in which you get conjugation and movement of DNA. Now, most of the time when we think about um, horizontal gene transfer, we're thinking about this in the context of antimicrobial resistance in clinical situations. So this is how um, uh, antibiotic resistance is spread in hospitals. <clears throat> However, <laughs> the reason that I thought this would be interesting as a, a process to study within a community is that communities are where this happens, right? And so most experiments looking at horizontal gene transfer, you're either tracking um, individual antibiotic resistance alleles through a clinical situation, or you're thinking about how, um, how this process, the molecular mechanisms within an individual, how this might work. But given that this has to happen within the context of community, I thought this could be a really great opportunity to use our system to understand this incredibly important process in microbial evolution. So we wanted to know how horizontal gene transfer operates in and impacts microbial communities. So the way that we decided to go about this is to start with our genomic resources that we had built. Um, so we took genomes of 165 different cheese um, isolated bacteria and we looked for regions of high sequence identity between pairs of genomes. So let's say these are two different species, this purple one and this green one, but they both have this red gene, which is identical. So these two different species across their entire genomes have relatively low sequence identity, yet they have this region of very high sequence identity. So that would suggest that this red region was probably transferred into these genomes, either from one of these organisms or from a common donor species. Okay. So this is the basic approach that we used to look for regions of horizontal gene transfer. So we scanned across genomes, which were at least were less than 89% similar genome-wide, and then looked for short regions, at least 500 base pairs long, of 99% identity um, at a minimum. And we did this across this set of four different phyla, 165 genomes. And this is what we found. So what I'm showing you here, these lines are connecting um, parts of this tree based on the fact that we identified regions of nucleotide identity between these pairs of otherwise unrelated genomes. And the thickness of the line indicates how much nucleotide identity we actually saw between these pairs. So you see huge amounts of DNA shared across these relatively um, closely related species. Um, within the actinobacteria in general, we detected quite a lot of horizontal gene transfer. Um, we also have some potential uh, cross phylum horizontal gene transfer. But overall, we found over 4,000 genes within this data set that we think are likely the result of horizontal gene transfer. So these are individual snippets, but we wanted to see, you know, in, in many cases, genes move as large groups. So we looked to see at these, to look, we looked at the, these individual genes and asked, are they close to other genes that we picked up? So if they were in um, close genomic proximity to another horizontally transferred region, we clustered them. And this allowed us to reduce this data set from over 4,000 individual units into 259 groups. So genes that we think were probably transferred in the same event based on being close together in the genome. 
And what I'm showing you here is a bubble plot, which is slightly complicated, but represents a lot of information. So on the bottom, um, we have this ranked by nucleotide content. So this is actually high nucleotide content over here, which means large amounts of DNA were shared between species. And each of these bubbles rep represents one of these groups. And the, the size of the bubble is proportional to the number of species that we see that are participating in this transfer. So we actually don't see, we see, so we see in addition to genes being shared between pairs of organisms, we see genes that are being shared between large groups of organisms. So genes that are being shared amongst many community members. So in this particular group right here, we have 33 different species that have at least part or all of this particular cluster which has on average about 23 genes in it. Okay. So this is great. We have these 259 groups, but are these just random fragments of DNA or are these actually important for what's happening in the community? So we looked at functional annotations in these regions and it turns out that there are some functions that, you, that keep appearing in this data set. So, the, the number one function that we see are genes associated with mobile elements like transposases, but the second most abundant function that we see in these regions are actually genes involved in iron um, acquisition through sidirophores. So I'll talk more about this. Another interesting thing that we see are genes involved in lactose and lactate utilization, which makes complete sense in the context of cheese where um, lactose is the primary car carbon source. <clears throat> So why, why would iron um, sidirophore genes be so important? Well, it turns out that cheese is a very iron-limited environment. Um, milk, mammalian milk has lactoferrin, which is a, a human um, a nutritional immunity protein, which specifically binds iron to prevent microorganisms, <laughs> in part to prevent microorganisms from accessing iron. <clears throat> and the other thing is that uh, this community is growing on the surface, which is an aerobic environment, which means that any iron that is present in the cheese itself is going to be in its insoluble ferric state. So microorganisms basically are going to have a really hard time growing unless they have very specialized ways of getting at iron. So how does this happen? How do they do this? So if you imagine a cell living on a piece of cheese, um, and the same thing is true in the soil, in human hosts, in many environments where we, in the ocean, that often iron is the key sort of missing thing that microbes are fighting over. <clears throat> so this cell needs to get at this insoluble iron. So what it does is it uses a specialized group of biosynthetic enzymes it produces a small molecule called a sidirophore, which this is not a sidirophore, this is just my really generic molecule structure. <laughs> um, they're much more complicated chemical structures, um, which is why you need special, um, usually non-ribosomal peptide synthase machineries to build them. They're exported through dedicated export machinery into the environment where they can chelate and bind this iron that's present. And then you need specialized uptake systems to transport the iron bound sidirophore back into the cell so now this iron can be reduced and released and used by the cell. And when we look at these um, uh, genomic regions that are horizontally gene transferred, what we see are um, in the actinobacterial 15 um, of these species have this um, uptake system that's homologous to ferric and pterobactin uptake. In proteobacteria, we see um, a, a, a different type of um, uptake system. And in staphylococcus, we also see um, an uptake system. Why these tend to be clustered with phosphonate uptake, I have no idea. If anybody has thoughts on this, I would love to hear them. But the, interesting, the, the thing that we thought was interesting is that we only see the uptake systems being horizontally transferred within the community. And so this is interesting to me because within the context of a community, this iron acquisition landscape is altered. Because if you have a neighbor who happens to just make an uptake system, they can actually suck up the sitter for us that you spent a lot of cellular money making. Okay, so this is known as cheating. 
Um, so it's possible that what we're seeing is horizontally, horizontal transfer of modules that allow some amount of cheating within the system. So we have tons of questions <laughs> about this. One of the things that we wanted to look at and see, you know, how are these things actually moving around? Um, and it looks like in several of the cases that these mobile elements are um, being moved, moved around by um, things that are called integrative and conjugative elements. So in this case, this is from um, an Arthrobacter species where we have the uptake system. There's a bunch of other cargo that I'm not showing you here, but we see these genes that are typically found on these types of mobile elements. Things are required for integrating and excising from a bacterial genome, for replicating itself, and for building a conjugation apparatus. These are flanked by direct repeats, and it's integrated right next to a tRNA. So these are all really key signatures of this particular class of mobile element. And what this mobile element does, it's actually pretty cool. If, if this is your um, integrative and conjugative element here, what it can do is it can excise itself out of the genome as a circle. It can then build its own channel between cells and transfer itself into a new cell, and then encode the machinery to pop into the new bacterial genome. So they're kind of remarkable systems. So, and we see this over and over again in these horizontally transferred regions that they're encoded as part of these um, integrative and conjugate elements. So we wanted to see if this is actually still happening in these organisms. So the first thing we did was to see if we can actually look for excision of the system. So I developed primers that um, flank the ends, the middle, and the end here. And the idea is that if we, we see excision of this mobile element from the chromosome, these primers one and six, which are normally 50 kilobases away from each other, would never amplify if there wasn't excision. But in an excision event, they're brought um, right next to each other. So you would see a PCR event here. And you can actually detect the circularized product through these two normally outward facing primers. And in doing this, we actually saw evidence of excision. So primers one and six, which is this here, show us a really nice band, suggesting that this mobile element has popped out of the chromosome. And this is, there's a very faint band here, but um, gel extraction and sequencing revealed that this is actually this band here showing the junction of where this um, ice element circularized. So we think this is still um, a functional mobile element. And now we have many, many questions to answer about how this is actually happening within communities. So we want to know um, which steriforms these systems are actually transporting and who is making the steriforms. So if we only have the uptake systems, what do they actually recognize and how many different species might be making steriforms that these things could import? We want to think about this um, process within the context of a multi-species community. So how does this process impact the growth of an individual species, but how does it impact the interactions within the community and community properties like stability? So you can imagine that transfer of a cheating um, module within a community might have detrimental effects. Um, how is that mitigated, if at all? Um, these are all questions that we're thinking about. And then we want to know what the timing and frequency of these processes are within a community. So we haven't actually yet shown this is an active process within a community. So we're trying to tag and track these mobile elements um, and see what factors affect um, their transfer. So just to summarize, um, I've shown you today how we went from a um, in situ microbial community um, looked at the microbial ecology, thought about the dynamics and patterns of diversity. We dissected this um, into a set of uh, culture collections and strain and genomic resources, and we've built a community um, that we can now work with and try and address some of these questions about the impacts of species interactions and, in this case, horizontal gene transfer in an in vitro system. And so with that, I'll thank my lab. I do pretty much none of this now on my own <laughs> or any of it at all. Um, <laughs> I have really talented postdocs, uh, amazing PhD students, um, great support, and um, a great set of former lab members. And um, initially, this, this project, my work was funded through the Bauer Fellows Pro Program at Harvard that let me do all this amazing sort of initial work. 
And now we have funding through UCSD Center for Microbiome Innovation, um, the Packard Foundation, and the Pew Charitable Trust. So with that, I'll thank you and take questions. Questions? Don't be shy. Yeah. Going back to the change of Yeah. Um, making different types of Yeah, right. So I didn't talk about that at all. Um, so in this large sample collection that we did initially, we also collected several types of metadata on those communities. So we looked at the geography, we looked at the pH, we looked at the moisture, salinity, we looked at whether the milk was raw or pasteurized, if it came from a cow, goat, or sheep, and we tried to see which of those different parameters most closely mapped with community diversity. And it turns out that the the only uh, measure where we saw any significant um, association was moisture. So what that means is that as when a cheesemaker is making a cheese, there are many different types of manipulations you can do to end up with a, a starting product that has different levels of moisture. So whether it's a hard cheese or a soft cheese, for example, where we see very different types of microbial communities, um, we think what happens is that moisture is something that microbes really care about. Moisture selects for different types of microbial populations. And so that is the thing that we identified as you know, one of the major driving forces. Yeah. Yeah, Larry. Thank you. So in the body of the cheese, yeah. microbes Yeah, so there's a completely different community inside the cheese, which is um, made primarily of lactic acid bacteria. Um, Depend if you have a raw milk cheese, there's more diversity there. If it's pasteurized, you inoculate with a very specific starter culture mixture of, say, two or three different um, cultures of lactic acid bacteria. And occasionally, you can have fungi if, if it's like a blue cheese, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I've eaten a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, so, so the question is, should you eat the rind? Um, and, and I would say that, you know, except in obvious cases where the rind is like wax, um, it's edible. It may not taste good, depending on the cheese, but I always tell people to taste it because sometimes a lot of the flavor that's being generated, especially in soft cheeses, is at the rind. So don't waste that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was struck in the one slide you had in the area of Yeah. So uh, huh. do you do you know what it normally spoils or um you went to isolate the very mice and meat sleep. So it comes up from a Oh, meats. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, um, what's going on with Diberomyces? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. In our Diberomyces versus others, yeah. Yeah, that's an inter interesting question. We haven't looked at that, um, whether our Diberomyces is different from ones isolated as spoilage organisms. Um, it's not surprising, I mean, often stored prepared meats are stored in cool environments, cheese caves are cool environments. So it's possible that they're closely related, but I, I don't actually know. Yeah. Um, but they're very important in the cheese flavor development. So yeah, in this case, they're definitely not considered spoilage organisms. Yeah. So when you show the, the composition of, of uh, species, you use a genus. And yes. so is that because, for some Staphylococcus, there are many species of Staphylococcus. Yeah. And they are in different uh, type of cases, or, or uh, what's like, yes. the level of the species? Yeah, so we don't know yet. So the reason we focused on the level of, of genus is because um, when we did the sequencing um, back in 2011, um, you know, based on the short reads, the, 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 the place where I had the most confidence of, of sort of Putting the classification was at the genus level. That might be a little different now if we were to go back and use slightly longer reads. Um, 
But I can say in terms of Staphylococcus, right, so there's many different staph species um, in the world. <laughs> and when we actually isolate organisms from these cheeses, we'll see um, four staph species very commonly co-occurring on cheese. And we see them over and over again. They're all coagulase negative staph species um, that are normally found on the skin of animals. And actually, many of the species that we isolate are very similar to skin associated organisms. We think that's where many of the, the rind community is coming from. It's actually, cheese is a similar environment to skin in the sense that it's aerobic, it's salty, there's a lot of fat and protein around for the species to eat. So we think they're probably coming from the, the animal and being transferred and finding a nice environment on the cheese. Yeah. But I think it'd be super interesting to look at species level um, or even strain level diversity. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We should probably stop okay, it sorry. for a fascinating I'll talk. be here all day. She'll be here all day <laughs> at the cheese and wine reception. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, give me a mic for that. Great. Thank you again. It's great.